Sup, y'all, and welcome to the Geography of Industry and Services, Part 8. In this video, we're going to wrap up our discussion on industry and services, talking about the rise of the service sector. And we'll ask this essential question, how have core states deindustrialized and shifted toward service economies? Since the 1970s, the most developed countries have transcended into the post-Fordist era and have witnessed substantial growth in the service economy, in tertiary, quaternary, and quinary activities. Of course, not all service jobs have an equal impact on the economy. For example, the hair salon provides important services for sure. However, their services are relatively low cost, and a single salon's impact on the economy is of relatively low benefit. By contrast, a hospital provides even more important services, such as life-saving surgeries, these highly specialized services are of high cost and high benefit to people in the immediate area and often to people far away. Recall that this represents a key difference between low-order services and high-order services. In the United States, factories have been relocating from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt since the Great Depression. Continued outsourcing and offshoring has led to increased deindustrialization, and while new industrial zones have formed in the U.S., they are concentrated in certain specific areas. That said, the most productive region in the U.S. is still in the North American manufacturing belt. Another district of manufacturing exists in the U.S. southeast, along cities such as Richmond, Charlotte, Atlanta, and Birmingham. The southwest district runs along New Orleans, through Houston, the Dallas-Fort Worth region, as well as Oklahoma City and Tulsa. California has two manufacturing districts, in the south between Los Angeles and San Diego, and in the north between San Francisco and San Jose. Finally, there is the Northwest District, from Portland to Seattle. This district even extends into Vancouver, Canada. The geographical dimensions of the service economy can be complex, so let's look at some considerations. First, looking at the location tendencies of service industries. Especially when compared with secondary activities, they are usually not tied to raw materials. They typically do not need large amounts of energy. This is supposedly true, although they still do benefit from competitive energy prices. Market accessibility is much more relevant, as they need to be available to people. However, for many tertiary activities, advances in telecommunications have rendered market accessibility less important. Many companies are closing stores as people can increasingly shop on sites like Amazon and eBay. There are many quaternary activities that are strongly tied to the locus of economic activity that require high levels of interpersonal contact, and therefore tend to be located near the businesses they are serving. Examples include banking, insurance, real estate, accounting, and certain administrative positions. That said, physical accessibility is decreasing in importance for many quaternary jobs, such as computing and coding. Many call centers for technical help are increasingly located in regions with lower income and wages, such as the U.S. South, but also in other English-speaking countries like the Philippines and India. What matters most is infrastructure, a workforce that is sufficiently skilled but not too expensive, and favorable tax rates. Most quinary activities are located around large metropolitan areas. Often referred to as gold-collar jobs, they concentrate around transport nodes in close proximity to major transportation and communication networks. These jobs are primarily found in the core, where networks of research, development, and technology are possible, as in Silicon Valley. Historical decisions may influence the location of these zones, such as the concentration of government jobs around national capitals. These zones are thought to be pollution-free and friendly to the environment. However, they are not always as good as advertised. Often, land must be cleared and green spaces can be lost. Furthermore, the production of goods such as computer processors and semiconductors require great quantities of water and even toxic substances to manufacture. MDCs establish high-technology corridors, areas designated by a local or state government for businesses to benefit from lower taxes and an upgraded infrastructure. The goal is to provide high-technology jobs to the local population. Silicon Valley is a classic example, located near Stanford, in the University of California, Berkeley. Another type of region found in MDCs are technopoles. These are areas planned to be a center of high technology research and development. Usually, in these areas, companies, and especially MNCs and TNCs, agglomerate, providing a synergistic benefit for themselves and others. 
An example is the Route 128 corridor in Boston, located near the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard University. These zones are basically synonymous, however, high-technology corridors are established by governments, whereas technopoles are created by the businesses themselves over time. High-technology corridors and technopoles may become growth poles, where the agglomeration of businesses spur economic development in the surrounding area. The Research Triangle in North Carolina is an example of a high-technology corridor, technopole, and growth pole. Located around Duke University, NC State, and the University of North Carolina, around the cities of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill, it has been home to numerous high-tech companies and enterprises since the 1950s. Tourism is a service industry giant and has grown substantially in the post-industrial world, as populations in core regions gained more disposable income and improvements in transportation and communication made places closer in terms of relative location. Many developing nations, such as those in the Caribbean, have attempted to improve their economies through tourism, with varied success. The investment by the host country is often huge. Roads, bridges, and ports need to be constructed, and money can be diverted from investments like schools or other valuable services. Additionally, while hotels and restaurants provide some jobs to the local populace and affect the local economy somewhat, they are mostly owned by MNCs from foreign states, and the best-paying jobs are dominated by people from those countries. In some instances, tourism has diminished the distinctiveness of the cultural landscape, making it more homogenous. Hotels, fast food chains, resorts, and theme parks are frequently designed to make people feel comfortable and may not reflect the local landscape. Furthermore, tourism can cause environmental degradation through litter, pollution, and harming wildlife through the expansion of the cultural landscape. However, tourism can enhance the distinctiveness of the cultural landscape if it is economically viable to do so. Many people travel for an authentic experience, so the locals pursue place preservation and work to maintain the uniqueness of their regions. Historic buildings are often protected and indigenous lifestyles may be sustained. Some of these cities and states work to promote their exotic scenery and wildlife through ecotourism. This helps them conserve natural resources. To bring this all to a conclusion, since the 1990s and the advent of the internet, people have declared an end to geography and the death of distance. <laughs> Technology has certainly decreased the significance of location and place, but geography is still of paramount importance. We've seen the vulnerabilities associated with manufacturing regions, as demand for cheap labor shifted production to new locales and countries. Service jobs may also be vulnerable to the changing economic landscape. For example, tourism thrives when economic times are good, but then plummets when times are tough and people tighten their budgets. While online services and jobs are growing seemingly exponentially, cyberspace feels like it is everywhere, ubiquitous. However, it is essentially nowhere, weightless. Aside from servers, computers, and wires, the Internet of Things occupies almost no sizable space. Yet, the physical and digital is truly interdependent. A plethora of technologies and apps rely on places to operate. For example, calling an Uber requires transmitting your absolute location. Ultimately, we still live in a world of artifacts, a world we can see, touch, smell, hear, and taste. In sum, geography matters. That is correct.